um to the uh the link and okay. I, Let's try to do the link again yeah it should bring you in you know we usually don't have too much trouble but of course you know just as i say that i'm sure i'm sure something will happen i'm just gonna go and make it public so everyone could see how awesome you are let's see edit privacy public done okay so we are good we are good in there now and we'll Perfect. give we'll we'll give people a a few few minutes to uh absolutely to jump on in hey rob how are you buddy how's the weather out where you're at right now amanda oh me uh i got pelted with about 20 inches of snow last night so i spent about three and a half hours that's right we're in pennsylvania <laughs> yeah oh my gosh i I don't know why for a second I was thinking California, but now, yeah, I, I remember. Oh, wow. You're That's in the, the most snow we've gotten in a long time. So, oh, mm. yeah. I, I, I got to be honest with you. I'm from Jersey originally, and my, my family got hammered too. Hey, Terry. Hello, Robin. Um, you have something, you have, there's something on there, Amanda, where if you click on it, you could see all the comments and stuff. I don't know if you see them now. Oh, uh, yeah. There it is. Hey. Oh, see, you are tech savvy because I don't know how to tell you how to do it. <laughs> oh, I, cool. I, I do miss the snow a little bit. Um, in Kentucky, we don't get much at all. A couple it's of years ago, we got hit with 12 inches, like back to back. Oh. It shut us down for weeks. Yeah, we, <laughs> you know, they they just they just can't handle it here. So you got all kinds of people jumping on right cool. now. Want to want to yeah, hear no it's pretty but uh it wears off fast i'm like okay now i can't track i can't exercise my dogs I, it uh it gets old pretty quick especially that much snow i mean that's yeah. that's that's a that's a whole different ball game you know yeah. hey steven uh, steven steven jackson was one of the people that jumped on and was like this is who you have to have on there you know yeah. and 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 of, and of course dave croyer too threatened threatened me with some violence and block blocking me from his channel so it was it was an easy uh yeah no kidding terry she did make that look easy all right amanda we'll get started you got all kinds of people on here already cool. and, and so the, the whole purpose of these interviews was for one i love talking to everyone about dogs but just to get more people and it's not really an interview as just a conversation you know I think there's so many good people out there that so many young trainers need to start broadening their horizons and, and seeing there's a lot of different people, a lot of different trainers, you know, and as I told you before we came on here, um, the people that know you, they don't only really respect what you do, but they really like you, like you were highly highly spoken of by so many people so i was pretty excited about this so just real quick amanda tell everyone uh where you're at and who you are and what you do a little bit cool yeah um uh, my name is amanda i live in central pennsylvania i've been doing schutzen for about 13 years uh, i started with a dog that didn't quite have the temperament um she was my first dog and then i moved to something a little bit more ferrari like and i did decently well with him as my first Schutzen dog. I, um, you know, made a lot of mistakes just like everybody does. Um, was new, you know, trying to, to figure it all out. Um, it would, being a new handler with such a, a high caliber dog was, was, uh, definitely difficult. Um, but I've since, uh, titled many dogs from him. I learned a lot from him. Um, I have, you know, trained with a lot of different people since training that dog. Um, I have geared my whole breeding program around that dog, which is pretty cool. Um, and so I run a dog training business. I've been doing that for uh, three years, I think. Uh, so dog training business for three years, mostly pet dogs. That's the bread and butter of it. Um, but I do have quite a few Schutzen clients who don't mind uh, training under a, a female who can't really do the long bites and move dogs like most men can. So I appreciate my clients that stick with me and 
uh, trust that I will get them where they need to be uh, in Schutzen. So. Awesome. Yeah, you you kind of you kind of do it all. Uh, hope I could be you here in the near future too. Once I start dabbling in the, in the, sh I love that you say Schutzen too. <laughs> you know, because I can't I can't keep up with all the 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 changes anymore. You know. So let me ask you that first dog that that was tough on you, man. You think that helped or hurt you in the beginning when you started uh, in Schutzen? For, for sure, helped me. I learned how yeah. to fail. Uh, I learned small wins. Um, I learned not only, I tell my current clients, not only do I know how to train from a puppy up, um, but he allowed me to learn how to fix things, right? So when people come to me and they say, hey, my healing is uh, not where I want it to be, or my dog is doing X, Y, and Z, I can say, oh, I've had that problem. And uh, now I can, I can kind of help them fix it. Uh, because I've I've been there and I've done that, and so he has totally shaped me, which is pretty cool. That's awesome. And Marcus Hampton's on. He says, "Me too." Schutzen. I never yeah. see Marcus on these, you know. And that's you talk about Schutzen. There's there's a good guy to to learn from, you know. Awesome. Yeah. And so, who were your biggest influences? At, you know, when you first got started in this in the sport, and what pushed you towards getting into the sport? Um, so as a little girl growing up, uh, I loved German Shepherds. It was always German Shepherds for me before, uh, before dog sport. And so when I was in college, I got my first German Shepherd and I knew enough to do some sort of, uh, research. And so I did end up getting a German dog and I realized that Schutzen was a breeding requirement over in Germany and that there were breeders here that did it. And so I found myself, um, with, with a group actually that was like five minutes up the road. I was in college. I went to Penn State University. Um, I was with them for a little while. And then I kind of moved on to um, somebody a little bit further away, but somebody who helped me tremendously in the beginning of the sport. Uh, a lot of people probably know of him, Tim Karchnak. I owe a lot to him. Uh, he got me started. And obviously, um, Ivan Balabanov was instrumental in teaching me how to train dogs. I trained with Ivan uh, many, many times. I went down to Florida. Uh, we had him here in Pennsylvania a few times. And so uh, watching him work dogs, watching him work with other people, working my own dogs with him, um, truly, truly shaped who, who I am as a dog trainer. Yeah, I think a lot of people in the sport could could probably say the same thing, you know, yeah. about Ivan. Carolyn Hart says to tell you she you gave her a four leaf clover at a trial a while back when she passed her VH. Carolyn's a friend of mine, and I thought of her when I realized you were in Pennsylvania because I know she's up there too. That's so I it's always good. that now. Hi, Carolyn. <laughs> always good to find good people. So let let me ask. So you got into Schutzen before the pet dog training thing, then? Cor yeah. Correct, Amanda? Yeah. Yeah, All right. I well, do you remember that that feeling of walking on to the field? What was that first experience like? Like I had a ticking time bomb next to me with yeah. its own dream. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and when you got through it, was that it? Did you catch the bug? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I have I have molded my whole life um, around Schutzhund and, and German Shepherds and. Um, I, I can't see doing anything else in the near future. So, oh, that's, that's awesome. So I have to ask you this because mm -hmm. every time your name came up, okay. all right, they talk about the shepherds, they talk yeah. about you personally, people speak very highly of you, but I, you know, people can't stop talking about your chihuahuas and your, the chihuahuas you breed. Okay. Sure, how, sure. how the heck do you go from shepherds and shits into chihuahuas? Um, so when I was training with Tim, um, another woman in the club, Molly, uh, who I have gotten German shepherds from, uh, she would always carry around her chihuahua. And in 2013, when the WSB was in Philadelphia, we drove down together and her little chihuahua sat on my shoulder while we drove down. And uh, I said, man, I could really use one of these. This is super cool. And she started to breed them. And so I got one. And the only reason I breed chihuahuas is because I have, I've lucked into getting some really nice ones, right? Like, and that's, Pretty much how my whole breeding program even goes with the German Shepherds is 
I only really started it because I have nice animals in front of me. I don't seek it out. I just, I, I wouldn't be breeding them if I didn't have something right in front of me, like super friendly, confident, social, um, which is not a lot of things that people see from chihuahuas. And so yeah. um, I, I kind of capitalized on the opportunity there. And that's, that's what everyone has said to me. They said, basically your chihuahuas are like really well-bred German shepherds. <laughs> and I, and I try to raise them the way that I raise shepherds. Right. So I don't free feed. I make sure they go home with food drive and they're handled and, um, you know, they're not, they're not coddled. And, you know, I, I try to raise them the way I would raise a working dog. <laughs> That's awesome. So what's your daily routine? Well, first, how many dogs do you have personally? We don't talk, we don't talk about that. <laughs> that bad, huh? <laughs> no, it, no, it's not that bad. It's really not that bad. Um, but I have, um, I think six German shepherds, uh, and a couple chihuahuas and a little, a little mutt running around. So you have a really good vacuum. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm, for sure. <laughs> well, I, I got my shepherd puppy coming, uh, end of January, beginning of February. And I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm really excited. I can't, I can't wait. I was actually ready for a little dog to get for the family and my, my, my wife and kids, they, and my buddy, Terry, they surprised me with the retirement gift. So, um, I'm looking forward to it. I really am. So yeah. what's your, what's your morning routine look like? You wake up in the morning, your life with your dogs, paint a picture um, for us. <laughs> I wake up, um, I turn on the, the Keurig and uh, with every intent to drink some coffee. And then I let out the chihuahuas um, the little border collie mix thing that I have, uh, and a shepherd all in one yard. And then I let another dog out in the other yard. Um, and then I might start feeding. I might start cleaning something. I might get distracted by something dog related. Um, and then I switch out dogs again into another round. I might hand walk some dogs that are here for training. Um, and all the while, it's 30 minutes in and I still haven't had my coffee and I might still be in my pajamas. Um, so while I'm letting dogs out, I might go back in, run in, drink some coffee, um, uh, make a couple calls, answer a couple emails, um, change for the day, let out another set of dogs. Um, and then I usually start my, my classes, my, my dog training classes for the day. So. What do you feed your own dogs? Uh, I feed raw mostly. Um, I feed raw, but uh, a couple of them are hard to keep weight on because they're so active. So I will supplement with some kibble. Um, sometimes I'm currently switching from Pro Plan Sport over to Victor High Pro Plus. I really like uh, I really like the ingredients in that food, and it sounds weird to talk about dog poop, but I, re I really like the poop on the food. Um, but mostly raw, and for my my mother's. Um, my whelping mothers, I feed a nook shook, the 3232, which really helps keep weight on them. Uh, especially if a mother has a lar a large litter and they're, they're really taking everything out of her. So that's funny. You say that Amanda, because, uh, you got to watch with the Victor. I fed Victor for a long time. My dogs did really well on it, but yeah. I guess they were bought out not long ago. And, okay. uh, they switched out a lot of the proteins and replaced it with blood meal. Yeah. And then a breeder friend of, friend of mine said she had to take her dogs off of it because the dogs, she wasn't able to breed them. Their, their heat cycles were messed up. And, and then with my own female, she started having issues with her heat cycle and she got fat as hell. I, yeah. And I mean, and I don't feed a lot. Now I have a two-year-old female Malinois that's very active and she's blown up, you know? Right. Right. So I had, I had to take her off of that Victor, but it's funny you say the Perina pro plan because you don't think of dog people feeding Purina, but I've heard so many people do really, really well on it, which is kind of crazy. Yeah. yeah. And that's the you only know. reason I started feeding it was because a lot of competitors uh, swore by it, you know, right. uh, pro plan plus, right. The 30, 20, uh, or I'm sorry, the pro plan sport 30, 20. So, um, but yeah, but yeah, mainly, pretty. mainly the raw diet for sure. Uh, I like, I like the idea of feeding yeah. raw. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I tell my clients, I, I understand not everyone's going to feed raw, but you should start supplementing with some at least, you, you know. Yeah, yeah. 
Absolutely. So do you do um, mostly board and trains or privates or a combination of both? Uh, occasional board and trains uh, when somebody is traveling from a distance and is gung ho on, on me training their dog rather than somebody in their area for whatever reason. Um, I'll do that. But uh, mainly, uh, mainly lessons. It's it's just it's better for the person to learn over the course of many weeks than hey, here's two hours, um, you know, here's everything that your dog has learned in 30 days, right? So. Yeah, I agree. And the issue I have with long distance board and trains, I hate them. And I try to convince people to go in their area because for me, the real benefit of the board and train, I do many follow up. I do complete private sure. lessons with the board and train, yeah. you know, and you can't do that if someone's traveling 1500 miles. And uh, I wish, what are you drinking there? Oh, wine. I'm so jealous right now. I don't have a drink for this. <laughs> if there's I one don't. thing Dave, Dave Croyer said, he said, uh, what time's your thing tonight? And I said, you know, I told him, I said, do you have any tips for me? Because this is the first time I've done anything like yeah. this. Just drink and be candid. You'll be great. And I was like, all right. Yeah, that's it. You know, the issue with, with Dave is, I really enjoyed his talk so much because I, I mean, I really, I'm a big fan of what Dave does. You know, I, I just have so much respect for him, but I wound up drinking so much. There were so many questions I didn't get to. So right. I said, yeah. I, I, gotta, <laughs> I gotta be careful. Speaking of Dave. Yes. Okay. His dog Hector is yeah. a beast. Yes. He, he came from you. Yes. How did that happen? Um. So I, like I said, a lot of the, a lot of the breeding dogs that I have um, have been dogs that I have trained um, or that I have raised from puppies and, and titled. Um, I happen to decide to import one female for breeding, um, and I imported Hector's mother back uh, two two and a half years ago or so, um, and. Uh, I had a litter with her imported and then I bred her her next heat cycle and that was my H litter. And I had kept a puppy from that mother from the imported litter. I had kept a male back and I wasn't sure, you know, if the orthopedics were going to pass or what. Right. So you never know with puppies. And so I kept uh, I kept I kept Hector back for myself. Um, he was super, super nice puppy. And I raised him up and, you know, did some foundational stuff, you know, pushing into the hand and treat chasing and stuff like that, free shaping stuff. Um, and then the male that I was current, currently working, uh, past orthopedics. And I already had, she's three and a half years old now. So at the time, two and a half year old female who I want to be my current competition dog. And Hector at the time was, you know, seven, eight months old. And I just, it wasn't fair to keep him because I knew that he was, he was too good. He needed to be somebody's number one. And it also wasn't fair to my female that I put all this time into her. I want to compete sure. with her. I want to do well. I need to focus on her. And, uh, so I, I was kind of him hawing around like, Oh man, I want him to go to somebody, but I want it to be, he needs to be trained. Right. Um, I don't want him going to somebody who's going to get frustrated with him. He's a lot of dog. Uh, he wasn't barking at the time. And uh, I know a lot of trainers will, you know, want to do different things. But I knew that it was in this dog. And I knew that Dave knew how to train uh, the way that I would want the dog trained. And so I called Dave up and I said, hey, do you have a dog right now? Because uh, I have this, this young dog that uh, I think you might like. And so... He's like, oh, yeah, tell me about him. And then he had a couple of his colleagues uh, test the dog um, out at Nationals to, uh, 2019, maybe. Yeah, I think. And uh, I, I shipped him down. I said, all right, if you don't like him, I'll, I'll pay I'll pay to have you ship him back. But I think you're going to like him. So. so in other words, when Dave had his colleagues test the dog, what you're telling me is he didn't trust your word. <laughs> That's Richard. Dave, is that true, Dave? You couldn't trust Amanda. He speaks so highly of you and he couldn't trust your word. Uh, I think he wanted to see the dog do some protection work. So, well, I think, I think, uh, I think you made the right choice. And I think Dave made the right choice because yeah. that dog is, is looking 
pretty fantastic. And so that's got to give you a pretty tremendous sense of pride, you know, watching that dog progress. And, and you know, he's probably going to wind up going really far with them because that's, that's what Dave does. He has right. every, he's made a world team with every dog he's had, I think. So um, I am, I am, I choke up a little bit. I get a little teary eyed every time he puts a video of Hector on there. I probably am annoying the heck out of my, my Facebook followers. Cause I'm like, look at Hector, look what he's doing. Um, I don't but, blame you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I don't um, blame you. It's, it's, it makes me happy because I really wanted to keep that dog and I did, uh, I did what was best for the dog because I knew that he couldn't, he couldn't stay here being second or even third fiddle. So, well, see, and, and that's something that I think uh, Amanda is sometimes hard to find in this industry and in all segments, pet dogs, working dogs, everything is you did what you thought was best for the dog. Yeah. And I think if more people, like I said, in the pet dog industry everywhere just did that, we we would avoid a lot of problems in, in all areas of, of dog training. What was it about Hector that stood out a little bit from from the other dogs? Um, as a as a young puppy, you mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> he was uh, an a hole. Um, <laughs> just <laughs> uh, he would bite your pant leg, not let go. He was pretty extreme. Um, the food drive was there. Uh, just, he, he had phenomenal gripping behaviors. You would pick him up to try to take him off your leg and he would dig in deeper. Um, he was just, um, you just knew and you just knew it was, uh, something about the way, the, the way he looked when you pick him up, like, um, just, he was over the top, just over the top prey, over the top biting, over the top food drive, super confident, um, there were other really nice puppies in that litter as well. Uh, but to me, he, he almost seemed a little too extreme right. for the buyers that I had for that litter. Um, I was like, I don't even know if it would be ethical for me to put this puppy in the hands of, of the other people who were getting puppies from that litter. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Do you, do you track those puppies, the rest oh, of his yeah. litter? Absolutely, yeah. Definitely a couple uh, train with me. Um, so yeah. And I, you know, there are some really nice ones. Um, one went into a, one went into like a kind of a pet home. So. Gotcha. Really nice now, so, so people out there that are so interested in the training acts aspect and the people that are just starting to compete or going to start competing, what did you start focusing on first with Hexter as a puppy, as far as training goes? Um, so as Dave will say, uh, just teaching the puppy how to learn, right? Um, uh, chasing food, taking food from my hand. I, I, I really pay a lot of attention to pushing into the hand, building that work ethic. Um, not so much healing, um, but really a lot of free shaping, like going to the board, like some Deb Zappia stuff, um, going to the board and, and staying there under distraction. Um, working on stability in positions with the sit and the down um and really just kind of you know offering behaviors and and just being engaged clicker or verbal markers um with puppies it's always clicker for me yeah. um but as i as i mature the dog in training it always ends up going to a verbal marker just gotcha. one less thing one less thing in my hand right and that's an ivan balabanoff thing right like you have so many things, you have a leash, you have mm -hmm. treats, uh, you know, use, use your, use your verbal. Yeah. I kind of, this, the same, I enjoy the clicker stuff with the puppies, but sure. I, I actually, I, I haven't even been using a clicker for that long. Most of my puppies, I started with the, with the clicker, but I do enjoy the clicker with the puppies. And what I do with my higher drive dogs, if I'm trying to teach something complicated, yeah. where my verbal marker will elicit too much excitement. Right. I use the clicker because it actually stabilizes them. There you, you know? go. There you go. So, so that's pretty wild. So out of the three components of Schutzen, which part do you love the most? Mm, obedience, I think. I think obedience is my phase. Um, I love teaching all the components of obedience to a, to a dog, right? Like I have not 
I have not bought a trained dog yet. Um, and I think I really have a lot of joy in, um, I don't know, do, do any of us really like trialing? Like, I think we all just love training. Um, but I really enjoy training the different aspects and seeing the dog click and say, okay, now I understand this and getting them to a point where they're, they're enjoying themselves and you're playing. And, um, so I, I really, I really enjoy obedience. Gotcha. Which part do you dislike the most? Is there any? Uh, it used to be tracking. It used to be Track. tracking because like I said, with that first dog, uh, I was, I was really bad at it. Right? Like, I was mm -hmm. really terrible and it probably took me, um, a couple of dogs, two, three dogs to really actually even understand what I was training. Like I, I knew they had to sniff the ground and I knew they had to found, find the articles. Um, but I didn't, I didn't really grasp um, the drives and the concept and how to balance the, the want to and the have to, right? Um, I didn't understand that for the longest time. And so now that I understand it, I don't dislike it. Um, it but it's taken me a while to find, find my appreciation for tracking. What was the big change there, Amanda? Where was the light bulb that went off? What made you, you know, where'd that education come that just said, okay, I starting to understand this a lot better now. Was yeah. there someone that guided you along that way? Um, I've had a lot of, I've had a lot of trainers weigh in on my, on my tracking. Um, Fabian Robinson probably was the biggest uh, influencer in my tracking. Um, basically, and I use this phrase all the time, uh, cautiously confident right? Like you want the dog to understand their job. You want them to approach the track, um, knowing what their job is, but not, not too well. Right. Cause then they get, then they get a little cocky and get sloppy. And so you want them to understand, but not, not be out there playing either. Gotcha. Gotcha. Totally understand it. You could train a dog for one person dead or alive. Who would it be? train a dog from one person or for one person? For, for a person, for like somebody, I, I anyone in history. Like I train it and then they, and then they compete with it or? Not just anybody, could be anybody. Doesn't have to compete, could be compete, but you got one person, someone says, I need you to train this dog, pick who you want to train it for, dead or alive. Oh God, I don't know. Um, uh, who would I want to train a dog for? Give me a second. Ah, I would love to. <laughs> I would love to train a German Shepherd for Ivan Balabanov, and then have him go and do it. <laughs> that's interesting. That's that's very interesting. I like that. That's see, everyone always expects it to be someone dead, historical, like you know, very philosophical. That's that's pretty. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Let me see if we can get a couple of the questions here. Okay. Um, Christina Gates says, I just acquired a three-year-old shepherd and I want to learn about Schutzen. I'm excited to see what she has to say. Where should I begin? Okay. Besides the obvious finding a club, yeah. what do new people need to look for in a club? Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be a club. It can be a trainer. Um, it doesn't have to be sometimes, uh, you know, private lessons are, are more beneficial sometimes, right? It depends on how that person learns. Um, I know with my own clients, a lot of people that are starting out, start out in private lessons and then we ultimately end up having like group days or something so that they can see me train other people's dogs because a lot of people like to learn that way too. I know that I loved, I, I would sit at club training or I would call Tim and Carol Karchnack and I'd say, Hey, can I come down and sit in on your pet dog lessons? Right. And I would sit there for hours just watching them train other people. Um, so uh, I think that if you want to get started, find a trainer or um, Dave Corey's website. I have, I, I always laugh. I'm like, I think I'm going to put myself out of business, but I think you should go <laughs> sign on to Dave Corey's website because um, there are so many awesome videos on there and people can really learn a lot and it does not it, it doesn't take the place of somebody watching you saying hey hold your hand this way hey move faster hey you need to be you need to yes and, and run or, or something um so it doesn't take the place of an actual person but that website has crazy crazy awesome videos um but definitely find a trainer or find um 
if you can't find a club, right? I mean, and a lot of clubs are full or they don't want to have people come around until they know they're dedicated. And I get that. So if you can at least take some private lessons, even if it's once a month or something, uh, I would find a trainer that has done Schutzend, not just somebody who uh, talks about it. I, and I agree with you uh, with um, Dave's website. I tell people over and over, especially, and the one thing I was looking forward to with this conversation was as someone who trains mostly pet dogs, I do train working dogs and I, and I work with a lot of sport dogs, basically on fixing little issues that, that people have. And I think one of the biggest mistakes that I see in all of dog training is pet dog people not going to working dog people to learn. Yeah. I don't understand why they are wasting their time on YouTube with popular pet dog trainers that really don't know too much about training dogs. Yeah. They know about marketing and selling things when there's so many phenomenal working dog people out there that could change your life. Because in my opinion, if you understand the complexity of what it takes to perform at that level with yeah. a really you know, complicated animal, Absolutely. makes the pet dog stuff that much easier. How do you feel about that, Amanda? I absolutely agree with you. Um, when I first started my business, I kind of pitched my, my, my training plan and my business plan to my veterinarian, hoping to get some, some referrals my way. And, uh, I, I basically said, you know, I'm one of the only dog trainers that you'll probably see in this area that, uh, has my training being critiqued by a third party, right? So I am constantly having to uh, adjust and really reflect and have people look at my training and say, yeah, that's working or no, that's not working. And so um, I'm, I'm evolving with the times. I am sticking up with, I'm, I'm keeping up with modern dog training methods and uh, not just staying stagnant. So uh, and yeah, uh, there are a lot of people that come to me that are like, I went to another trainer and, you know, they don't do German Shepherds or, or something, right? They, they don't know how to work with the aggression. Um, and it's something that uh, I, I can't say that I've done a lot of, like working mm -hmm. with aggression cases, but um, working with German Shepherds in and of itself is something that allows me to have maybe a, a step up to somebody that doesn't work with German Shepherds on the daily when when they're supposed to be uh in the high performance uh dog sport so sure now you're obviously very successful and 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 people speak highly of you so there's so many people out there in this industry that that struggle it's not an easy industry you know yeah. and it's really easy to get burnt out but you know, I tell people all, all the time, you know, I have a big mouth and I'm always on here talking. I'm very, I know people have to be sick of me by now. But so when people, young trainers see me, because I talk to people every day, they think it's happy, go lucky, easy sailing. And they're always surprised when I tell people, listen, I doubt myself every day. I question myself. I worry that I'm not doing the best that I can. You know, I'm failing in certain areas. Do you ever doubt yourself? Um, I don't doubt myself as a whole. I might doubt uh, a training decision I've made. Um, you know, was that the right call? And I might sit on it for a while and, and, and be like, okay, well, I need to just stick with it um, and then see how it plays out. Or I'll be like, yeah, I think that was the wrong decision. I need to switch it. Um, so I don't, I don't doubt myself so much as sometimes my training decisions um, here and there. Yeah. Gotcha. What's your, one of your proudest moments, pet dogs or competition world that just sticks out where you were like, that's it. I've arrived. I've made it. This is the greatest thing in the world. Uh, <laughs> um, I think I, I can't, I can't pinpoint one exact moment. Um, going, going to the universal Seeger championship with, uh, Arco, who was my first real working dog, and then his daughter a year later, um, was was pretty was a pretty awesome moment for me going overseas and representing the United States. It's not the it's not the the WUSV World Championship that I'm striving to uh, 
striving to get on. Um, but it was the Universal Seeker Championship, which is um, Schultz and all three phases plus the show were uh, part of it, right? The confirmation right. part. So uh, we still have to do, you know, all three phases on a world level. And it was really cool to be over there with amazing people. And that's probably the one thing uh, that, that I am really, really proud of, but also, um, the, the dogs that I'm producing that I'm, that I'm, people are coming back to me to train with and I see mm -hmm. them mature. So, uh, just recently, like, um, the young dogs that I'm seeing that I have bred that are coming back for training, I, I have really been, uh, like so happy I could cry. Like every time I see them, I'm like, wow, this dog is phenomenal. Um, and so I really have a lot of pride in that. And it makes me, it makes me very happy because, um, breeding wasn't anything that I really like, it wasn't a goal of mine. I wanted to compete. Right. And I still right. want to, that is my main goal. Breeding is not my, my goal, but the fact that I, um, I see the dogs that I'm putting out, um, and I, and the people are happy with them. Like, I'm like, Oh, you, you like your, you like your dog. That's super cool. Right. And so I think that it makes me a little mushy. Um, That's great. No, I could imagine Cassandra Levy uh, as, as a breeder competitor, when you pick a puppy, do you pick with your heart or your brain example, the puppy who seems to be the total package or the puppy who really connects with you, but maybe isn't the standout. I think I know the answer here. <laughs> yeah. um, so I, the, most of the dogs that I've competed with have been picked for me um, by the breeder. Um, but when, since I've been uh, breeding my, my own dogs, the ones I pick are more with my brain, not my heart. So the one dog that I picked with my heart was my Batman, um, who I took to IGP three. I, I trained him to a national level, but then I retired him because he was trained, uh, perfectly, but he didn't quite have, uh, the grit that I wanted to, to make it to the world stage. And so he was the one dog that I think there was a, a little bit nicer of a puppy in the litter. Um, but I picked him because he had my heart and I will never regret that decision. Uh, but he definitely wasn't the, the pick of the litter. Right. And so sure. with, with the, and he wasn't, he's not my breeding. He's just out of my stud dog. Um, but the, the, the litters that I'm breeding now, when I'm picking puppies for me, uh, myself, I'm, I'm using my brain and I, I am giving myself anxiety at every, every turn, uh, about, and I'm overanalyzing every little thing. Uh, right. so yeah, I really use my brain. And Steven, to Steven Jackson, that's be good to tell people like, so when you're looking at a litter, I think a lot of times people think you breed two great dogs together. They're all going to be capable of doing all the work, which of course isn't the true. Yeah. How do you go about separating that litter? Good working prospects to a pet dog home. What do you look for? Super question. And I get this question all the time from people who want to buy a puppy from me. Um, and uh, I always lead with, I give myself anxiety the last two weeks, right? <laughs> like from six to eight weeks, I'm like, I, I can't focus on anything else. Like people are like, which puppy is mine? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. Um, and then it like two days before eight weeks, like which puppy's mine? I'm like, I don't know yet. Like, <laughs> um, let me figure it out. Um, but I really, uh, and then I, and then I, you know, kind of serious up a little bit and I say, listen, I, I watch the puppies every day starting, I mean, every day starting from birth, but really start to analyze their character from, from four weeks on really around six weeks. Uh, but I'm, I'm looking at so many things. I'm looking at uh, which ones are the first to the food dish, which ones are staying there longer than the other ones, which ones are taking corrections from mother and running away and crying, which ones are taking corrections from the mom and staying there and still nursing, um, which ones are the first to inspect uh, new things, new toys for Schutzen people, um, which ones are gripping toys full and carrying them around, um, which ones are, uh, you know, wagging their tail when I'm petting them versus not. Um, so, so many things that I really 
uh, that I really pay attention to. Um, so usually by seven and a half weeks before even testing them, I kind of have an idea of which ones are the pick working puppies, right? Um, which ones are, are biting my pant legs and not letting go, even though I'm hanging them upside down, um, which ones are, are digging in deeper into my skin. Uh, like, you know, those are, those are the working pick puppies. And so usually I can tell the first pick and, and then I can tell the, the pet puppies in the middle, it gets a little hazy. I'm like, well, this one, sure. could, you know, this one might be a little bit better than this one, but, um, it's, it's usually pretty obvious. Um, and so where people want to talk about, oh, do I just close my eyes? I think somebody made a, a question on one of your posts it, or maybe it was the Aquarius post. Um, do I just close my eyes and pick a puppy? Like maybe because puppies are always crapshoots. Uh, but I definitely would never do that because to me, when I look at a litter of puppies, I can say, yes, that one, maybe that one, definitely not these three. Right. So, um, and, and, and when I say definitely not, uh, definitely not in that moment, um, but could they be a sleeper puppy? Yeah, sure. Maybe they're sure. not uh, as drivey as the other ones, but um, usually food drive and stuff is there, right? So if I, if I see it at seven or eight weeks, um, and then uh, I just I kind of go from there. So some people will say, oh, is the... Um, is my puppy's not chasing. I had a friend reach out to me and he said, Oh, this puppy is super confident, but he's not chasing, um, you know, the flirt rag or whatever. I said, it's okay. Like he's a German shepherd puppy. Uh, he's probably just overly confident. He doesn't have any reason to be chasing anything that's moving. Um, so if he's the confident one and he has the food drive and, uh, all of that, is he, is he carrying toys full? If he's carrying toys full. Okay. Well, there's your answer, right? Just because he's not chasing something, doesn't mean that he's still not the pick puppy. Yeah, I've worked with some um, very nice shepherd puppies that, you know, 8, 10, 12 weeks old really didn't have much interest in, in chasing a rag or anything, like very yeah. little, and turned out yeah. to be phenomenal dogs, you know, with mm -hmm. tremendous drive and everything. So, yeah, yeah you, just, you just don't know. Do you yeah. have a, uh, a breed outside of your shepherds and chihuahuas? Do you have a breed of choice that if you had to get a dog just for a pet, just for a pet, is there a breed that that you're just crazy about that you you, you train or work with on a regular basis? Um, so I really want a super well bred border collie. Um, uh -huh. I don't know that, I don't know that they're they're like for a pet, right? Um, but uh, definitely a, a border collie because I I do dabble in agility a little bit. Um, so I would love to you know, as soon as I start doing agility, I, I get there and I'm like, man, I want to be competitive in this too. But I just I don't have time, you know? So um, I would love to have a border collie and actually be a, a competitive in agility. That would be super Well, cool. we may have to talk behind the scenes because one of the nicest dogs I've ever worked with was a border collie that came down from Canada for a board and train. Cool. And I'm so glad that guy didn't listen to me. Mike, if you see this, thanks for bringing Patty down. Drove down from Canada. And this dog had it all. But when his owner goes to work, that dog lays in the house and sleeps all day. Yeah. You know, doesn't just could chill out and do nothing. And he had everything. And I fell in love with that dog. And I really was considering because he was getting ready to breed him. And I was like, this would be a dream to have a dog like this. Yeah. Okay. Sure. A dream. Yeah, totally get it. Um, Isabella. Lomoth says, what situations would you warrant a high level stimulation on an e-collar and what's your opinion on choking a dog out? Is it necessary? It's a pretty violent question. That's a very <laughs> forward question. Um, what was the first part of that about the e-collar? What situations would warrant a high level stimulation on an e-collar? I almost didn't even ask you that. but it's, Yeah, it's um, for me, it would have to be something that is so super dangerous to the dog, right? Like chasing horses or something, right? Like, sure. uh, you know, um, high level corrections need to be done. Like it's either my dog dies or I give it a high level correction. Correct. Sure. And what's your opinion on choking a dog out for the out? It's like not choking them till they pass out, but choking them to get right. them off. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. <laughs> very different things. Um, 
I will often employ that. Yes, I, I definitely do that. Um, with young, young puppies, I will often just flip them upside down for them to drop something. I don't really need to choke them out. But if a dog, like, you know, if you want to build some drive or something, um, I've, I've seen people do that. Or, you know, if that's the only way you can get the toy off of them. For sure, I mean it has its place in dog training. For sure, um, I'm not against I'm not against a lot of things if done correctly. So. Why do you think so many people have issues training the out? Ooh, 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 ooh. That's coming from me because obviously, you know, I I, I do see a lot of police dogs. Um, I do see a lot of sport dogs. Obviously, the people that you're competing with know how to teach an out because yeah. the dogs have to out, yeah. you know. So why do you think it's such an issue in the working dog world still? Um, non, not being consistent, right? And I am a, I am a, a victim or a, I don't know if I'm a victim. I, I definitely am not consistent all the time as well, right? So I'll, I'll be super honest on that one. Um, not being, not being consistent with the out. Right. So um, letting your dog when you say out like, mm, yeah, I'll give it back to you in 10 minutes. Right. So um, making sure that there's clarity there and consistency, just like with anything in dog training, for sure. Sure. Um, Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, sometimes not outing on the field can also be, uh, you know, not necessarily a training issue could be something with the temperament of the dog, right? Like what I spoke about with my Batman, not mm -hmm. having the, the grit that I really kind of was, um, was hoping for. I saw an outing issue, right? And he's a super compliant dog. I knew he had the training. Um, mm -hmm. The outing issue was more of a, a reflection of, of where he was mentally uh, on the field, you know, so it can be that way too. And so having that perspective, you know. Sure. So, you know, I, maybe it's just me, but it looks like over the past 10, 15 years, dog training's exploded. You know, I, I guess a lot of because of social media and Facebook and YouTube sure. and all these things. When you entered the competition world, you're a young, young lady, of course, when, yeah. you, when you start. You're still a young lady. Um, <laughs> notice how I watch my words because I, I have a <laughs> wife and so I'm always careful how I say things. Sure, She's sure. making a face right now. <laughs> Have you seen a change on how women are perceived in the industry? Because let's face it, women are kicking ass out there yeah. in the pet yeah. dog world and the competition world. They can't be yeah. denied anymore. Yeah. Have you seen a change since you started to now? Um, you know, I never really paid much attention to that uh, when I first started. It wasn't anything that I, you know, even cared about. Um, but now that I'm seeing so many awesome female trainers just on the internet, awesome female trainers that are competing, like there's really a lot of us. And it's really, really cool because like you said, this industry has been dominated by men. Um, and it's even at, even at the club level, you see it's, it's a ton of women, right? And all the clubs, maybe like the helper and one other dude um, is, is a guy, but uh, at the top, it's always men. Right. And I, and I started to see that a few years ago, like, why are the men always at the top? Like the, the women dominate the, the clubs mostly that I was that I was seeing. Um, but I, we're starting to see a shift in that, which is super cool. Um, I think that women have a little bit more finesse in our dog training. Right. I think um, I, I think that we are starting to see, at least in Schutzend, um women can do it just because we can't do the helper work. Um, we can train the behaviors in, in all three phases. Um, and so like with my training club, um, we have one, one token dude, Shane, right? Like he's, uh, Shane's on here listening somewhere, but like, um, it's a bunch of women and we, we, we help each other out and we stand in the blind and we train the behaviors. And, um, I think that modern dog training, has given, you know, us women the tools to be like, yeah, I'll stand in the blind. Yeah, I will uh, give your dog a bite and uh, I can train the behavior just as just as good, if not better than any man. Right. And so, sure. um, yeah, I, I, I think it's really cool. I, I really, really enjoy it. 
I know in, in, on the pet dog side of things, I work with probably 70 to 80 percent women. Yeah. You know, and, and I like that better because they they just there seems to be less ego on average. Sorry, client guys that are watching this. You're you're it doesn't mean you. I'm just saying on average, the, the women, there seems to be a little less ego and they just they they want to learn. They they yeah. listen and and they soak it up. You know what I mean? Right. And I, I get a lot of clients. I don't know if you see this a ton. Of, and this is some of my favorite clients. I get a lot of husband and wives where the husband is just there to support the wife. That's always the best. That's fantastic. Yes. And I have a few of them on here now. Um, and the, the women really get into it. And the guy maybe not so into the dog, but he loves to see his wife happy and he enjoys watching her do it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when I when I get those teams, it's always it's always pretty, pretty kick ass. You yeah. Know? yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I, I um. I definitely, I definitely enjoy uh, women that can, can take charge and do this. And then the men that stand behind them and support them. Right. So. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. If you could change anything from when you started, is there something you do a little different? Um, if I looked back and did it differently. Um, yeah. um, you know what? I, I don't, I don't think so. Um, because where I can go back and wish that Arco and I had podiumed or made some world team because he was, everybody told me, like, even when I first saw Ivan years ago when he was two years old, he said, would you sell this dog? And I said, I don't think so. He said, but even though this dog can can do great things with, with big time handlers, you wouldn't sell him. And I said, no, I, I really love him and he's my dog and I want to learn with him. And so, um, I don't think I would even change that at this point because he taught me so much and I would not be um, where I, where I am now without that dog and without sure. going through everything. So um, yeah, I learned a lot. I, I see new hand, like I see people who are, are, are really uh, successful in this sport and they make world teams with their first dogs. And I'm, I'm always a little bit jealous of that. And I'm like, man, like, I didn't make a world team with my first dog. Like, I mean, I'm still chasing that, that dream. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I wish, so I, I wish that sometimes, but I still don't think I would change anything. Yeah. All right. So you make it to a world team. Okay. Yeah. Where do you want the destination to be and who's standing up there on your team with you? Oh, super fun. Um, Okay. Uh, destination. Um, I've heard Austria is beautiful, so I would love to go to Austria. Um, who's standing up there with me? Um, that's putting you on the spot now because so someone, someone's, someone's going to get pissed. <laughs> someone's going to get pissed that you leave out. Um, uh, I want to say, like, I don't want to say the big timers, right? Like, I love the big timers. I love the, sure. the Mike Gould and the Wallace Paynes and the, um, but I wish I, I want to be standing up there. I would love to be standing up there with people who um, have grinded and who have put in the work and are, are making it, right? Like, I think uh, last year's team, there was a lot of people who made it for the first time or maybe it was two years ago. I can't remember, but. Um, I would love to be standing up there with people who have just grinded, maybe didn't have the right dog, had some bad luck, uh, but are there, right? And made it, um, they trained their dog um, from a puppy and went through the, the ups and the downs and the, and the risks that go along with a puppy. And I would love to be standing up there with people like that. So I don't know if I can give you any names. I would love to uh, see my, my, my bestie. Grace uh, up there with me for sure. She's my my right hand lady. She is the one standing in the blind all the time for me, and she's the one that helps me pick puppies. She's the one that um, I uh, I'll be like, can you come over here and help me with this with this pick over here? Like just so I know that what I'm looking at is non biased, straight. So uh, I'm always bouncing ideas off of her. So I would love her to be standing up there with me. So super. well, that's uh, loyalty is very important. So that that's that says a lot about you because you could have thrown anyone out there. What do you do? You do anything outside of dogs? Do you have any other hobbies? Um, I I 
I have horses, so I haven't ridden my yeah, I haven't ridden my horses in a while. Uh, I trained horses for a small snippet of time in between my dogs. Like I started training mm -hmm. dogs, and I was like, let me train horses for a little bit. Um, a local lady, uh, I worked under her for a while. I learned how to ride. I learned how to train, um, and I think that really helped my dog training. Um, and so, um, when I have time, I like to ride my horses. Uh, but other than that, dogs are kind of where it's at. <laughs> Is there is there one dog in your career that you've seen in competition or non that you were like, damn, I wish I bred that dog? Um, yeah, I mean, I always look at I always look at the power that Vegas brings um, and and think that man, that would be an impressive. Animal. Who's the, who who's Vegas belong to? Vanderberg. Uh, I'm I'm botching the name, right? Okay, so Vegas Vanderberg Hint Hinty. Uh, Aaron O'Shea owns him, right? So. He's a powerful, powerful animal, uh, and he's been bred a ton and produces awesome. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, recent memory that dog. Um, but I, I, I don't know if I can think of anything else on the spot. Putting me on the spot, man. <laughs> here, here, here! I'm going to put you on the spot again. You don't have to give any names, okay? I won't ask that. But you ever, you ever go to a competition, especially the bigger trials? and get real excited or look forward to meeting someone you've always wanted to meet. And then you're like, wow, what an asshole. You don't have to give any names. <laughs> um, no, the opposite though. Like I, when I was at the, the worlds in uh, Philadelphia, the WSB was in Philadelphia, 2013. Mm -hmm. um, I walked by Mike deal. He said, hello. He didn't know who I was. And I was like, starstruck right and uh super nice man right just like super awesome. cool and uh but yeah i don't think i've ever i don't know if i've ever thought anybody was an asshole that's so. good that's 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 <laughs> that's that's absolutely fantastic brett Mer morell as when it comes to getting into training schutzen i have heard about different certifications for schutzen trainers helpers if someone wanted to start the path where is the best starting point and what direction would you steer people starting this path to get that overall goal? I guess he's okay, right. asking about certifications that would help get into the, to the sport. It sounds like. Yeah. So no certifications to get into the sport, right? Like right. just like the dog training, like uh, pet dog training, right? Like certifications aren't really worth much more than the paper that they're written on. I mean, unless you're talking about trial helper work and then your certification says, Hey, you went through the, um, you jumped through the hoop to work a trial in, in said organization. But, um, in order to get into Schultz and, um, I wouldn't necessarily pay attention to, uh, any certifications. I would, I would look at the people that you're training under what their accolades are, right? Have they actually sure. done anything? have they who have they coached right so um mm -hmm. not only what have they done on their own but have they coached people um that's right. often things that people uh, people miss uh that aspect of right like okay yeah they might be a good dog trainer themselves and they've had success but have they coached people do they have the talent to actually uh be proficient with their information so excellent tyler wants to know what advice would you give a pet dog owner who has a working line dog in terms of activities to stimulate the dog? Yeah, excellent question, Tyler. Sure. Very good question, because it happens yeah. a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I always tell I always tell my pet clients, I make place uh, kind of a, a game, right? So you have to be careful, because with pet dogs, you want place to be more of a duration exercise, but um, you can switch it up and kind of um, do much like what Deb Zappia does with the board, um, where you can send a dog there and work them like they want to come off, but they know that they're not allowed work them under distance, duration, distraction, work their brain and then throw food and let them explode into drive, get the food come running back. Um, so it, it's kind of a, a physical and mental stimulation for the dog. And you can do that inside when there's, you know, 20 inches of snow outside. Um, but any type of mental mental games, free shaping things like free shaping tricks and stuff like that. Um, obviously, retrieving is going to tire a dog out. Um, but everybody always wants to throw the ball 400 yards, right? So when I want to tire a dog out, I do more small, quick repetition back and forth. It keeps me 
uh, as the focus instead of all that time running away from me getting the ball. So more kind of back and forth engagement with, with retrieving. Excellent. So. Love it. You ever see yourself competing with a Malinois? Yeah, for sure. Um, really nice. Yeah. <laughs> I love um, I love kind of those fast twitch twitch dogs. The female that mm -hmm. I have now is kind of fast twitch, and the male that I have is not. And I'm like, ah, oh, does he have enough? Like I don't know what's going on, but like everybody's like, he says plenty. Like he's not your female. Like he's a German Shepherd, not a Malinois, right? So I'm um, kind of like, hmm, maybe I maybe I want a Malinois. <laughs> um, but I always say. If I want a Malinois, uh, it has to be one of those big, gorgeous, dark-headed, uh, big head, nice dark face uh, Malinois that kind of looks like a German Shepherd. Sure. Uh, yeah. But uh, I've seen some Malinois that I would own for sure. Yeah. I get it. Favorite movie of all time? Ah, Tommy Boy. Uh, Chris Farley. That, that's <laughs> can't get me there. That is the best movie on the planet. There is no hesitation there. <laughs> nobody wants to watch that movie with me because I just repeat every single line, and they're like, "Okay, man, I'm turning it off. This is not fun." <laughs> that's that's awesome. Favorite musician of all time? Mm, it's kind of cliche, but I love Garth Brooks. I'm a I'm a huge uh, country music fan. So me too. Uh, me yeah. too. Took the took the wife to see him uh, two years ago oh, in Nashville, nice. and she was not excited because she's not a country music fan. boring for her. Yeah, no, actually, it wasn't boring for her because when okay. we got there, she got deathly ill and was throwing up so bad the the medics had to come take care of her. Yeah, yeah. So it was yeah. an it was an interesting night. Everyone just assumed she was drunk. She wasn't even drinking. Right, right, right. Did you even get your money worth of the concert at least, or no? Uh, I saw the whole concert. <laughs> <laughs> Send her on her way. She, want, she wanted me to. She had the medics with her. What was I supposed to do? <laughs> was, there. Yeah, we didn't even drive. Like We went with other people, so we couldn't leave. So I was yeah, like, yeah. Well, I might, just, I might. She is a big Chris Stapleton fan now, and, and oh. we've we've gone to see Chris Stapleton. and We were supposed to go this year, but it was postponed till next year. You know, yeah. but Garth Garth puts on a phenomenal concert. For sure. For sure he does. You know? Yeah. Is there anything you'd love to see change in the competition world or the pet dog world? What would be something that you think we all need to maybe work towards a little bit? Um, I don't know. I, I don't want to be cliche and say like um, support, right? Like, you know, I would love sure. to see people support people more. Um, you know, I don't, I don't really give much thought to that. I, I kind of put my head down and, and train my dog and, and focus on the people in front of me and the people that I have surrounding me. Um, so I don't really give much thought into, you know, what I would change. Um, you know, I think just maybe more support, less, less, uh, um, <coughs> probably. Now, now back to training, Amanda, and I'll let you go. I don't want to keep you on too long. No, so many, so so many people like really have interest in how you do things. Yeah. One of the things that I love about Dave's channel and why I think it's so important for people to watch his videos is because you see him doing the real training process and you see how basic and simple and consistent it is. Yeah. And I don't think many people realize how easy it is if you're consistent and just keep yeah. things really short and easy going. Yeah. How much time on average for the people out there, your competition dog, besides meeting on the weekend to train with people and stuff throughout the day, what are you doing to prep your competition dog in everyday life? Yeah. So I'm training my competition dog almost every day, right? Depends on the dog. Sometimes they need some, some days off, like they, they get burned out too. Right. So on those days off, I might hike or swim or just throw the ball. Um, but uh, I am doing rep after rep after rep. And I, uh, I say this all the time to people, like when I'm giving small little group seminar things or um, my, my current clients, like I, I will sit there and I will do a sit from a down, a sit from a down, a sit from a down, or go out, go out, go out. Um, I, I'm doing rep after rep after rep. And I always say, this is the stuff that nobody puts on Facebook. Okay, this is the grind that people don't see. People on Facebook see the fancy 
uh, retrieve or the long bite or the healing, right? But they're not showing um, you standing out there in 30 degree weather with your fingers freezing or bleeding or something and you're doing 200 reps of the same thing, right? And they don't show it because it's boring, right? But mm -hmm. um, I think it gives people a false sense of what dog training really is. Like they are expecting results super fast. Like, oh, my dog did it three times. Like he should know it. <laughs> <laughs> but like if your dog's not anticipating that behavior then then, then they don't know it right and right. so um I, i'm constantly just rep after rep so you know in any session i'm doing um sits from a down or down from a sit i might do 30 or 40 stands uh broken like each for two or three sessions a day right so um stand after stand after stand you just you do it you rep it you you get it in um, and then as you start to get ready to trial, you start to put it all together. And that's the, um, that's the difficult part that people need, need the help with. And I, I needed the help with it. I still need help with it sometimes, um, is putting it together and, and making that final product, right? A lot of people are really good at teaching the behaviors. Um, but putting it all together is a whole different ball game. So that's what scares me, Amanda, because if, you look at my current dogs, they do, I've taught all the things that you do in IGP. I love teaching that stuff. Yeah. I honestly have no idea how to put it together properly. Yeah. And yeah. and that's why it's so important to have someone with experience to, to learn from, you know, like, like really important. You working with your dogs, daily rations of food? Um, depends on the dog. Um, mm -hmm. So with a young dog, like I have a young puppy right now from my breeding. Um, that I'm raising up and um, Grace will probably take over with him soon because I don't need another Schutzen dog. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, with him, yeah, like I might take a cup or two cups of kibble and work him for that um, and then give him the rest at dinner time, whatever's left over, right? So yeah, sure. I'll definitely work young puppies for their food rations. In tracking, sometimes I'll be like, hey, your food is out there, right? Depends on where the motivation for the dog needs to be, if it needs to be mm -hmm. higher or or if I'm, you know, in a training spot where something, I need to change the mindset a little bit. Um, but yeah, with the puppies, the food ration for sure is a thing. Some dogs, like with this young puppy I'm working now, I could feed him and then go out there and work him and it wouldn't make a difference. Right. But, sure. I, but I also don't want him consuming six cups of food in a day. Um, yeah. so I have to be careful about that. Um, so as the, as the dogs mature, then I'm not working with food anymore. I'm, I'm moving to a toy, but I don't move to a toy, um, until, you know, 10, 12, 14 months depends on, depends on the dog. So, Sure. Alex Clinton asks, what do you think is good lifestyle balance for pet dog owners between loving on them, coddling versus structured living and training like what you were talking about with your chihuahuas? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that as long as your dog is responsive to the important things that you want, um, you can coddle and love on them all the, all you want. Right. My dogs are on the couch. My dogs, um, eat from the table. <laughs> my dogs, uh, my older dog, um, he'll jump up on my kitchen counter and I'll feed him, right? Like really bad, bad pet dog things, right? But um, as long as, I mean, he's given me a lifetime of, of things. And so I kind of just, yeah, I'll spoil you and coddle you all you want. Um, with my performance dogs, um, I, I work them. And then when we're done working, I do a lot of cuddling on them and and it's it's not really um you know it doesn't have to be one or the other i do a lot of both right um, now the first thing you said there is very important because the the people that have selective hearing will leave out the part where you say as long as your dog is responsive to you yeah and there's no be and i'll have and i'll add there's no behavioral issues right okay right. the first thing she said guys that's important as long as your dog is responsive to you Okay, yeah. if your dog is attacking you once a week, we got to change things up. <laughs> right? Yeah, absolutely. If your dog is growling or biting at you, okay, no more, no more on the couch, no more on the bed. Like, okay, we need to structure this a little bit. But if your if your dog is responsive and and doing the things that you want them to do, then I don't see a problem with um, any type of affection. I mean, I'm, 
I'm big on that with my dogs for sure. There you go. Pierre Rousseau gave the, it's the best state. What an awesome chick. That's his comment. Oh, <laughs> that was cool. it. What an awesome chick. Love I think that. Pierre's in France. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> you know, but not hey, listen, anything else you want people to know about you, um, where you're going to be in 10 years from now, what your goals are, anything, <laughs> let them know what you want to tell them now, Amanda, before I let you go. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, I just want to, uh, finish with, you know, if you're thinking about getting into Schutzen, definitely do it. It's super fun. Um, Schutzen dogs are the most well-trained dogs on the planet. Right. Um, and it's super fun. It's a lifestyle. You make a ton of friends. Um, it's really, really great. Um, don't be afraid of failure. Everybody fails, even the top people at the top, they fail. Um, don't be afraid of it. Just learn from it. Uh, grind harder, do better. Um, find yourself a good coach, find yourself a good, uh, good people to surround yourself with. Um, you know, if you train on your own, you train on your own and that's okay, right? Get the work in, um, get it in however you need to get it in and don't let anybody tell you that, uh, you can't do anything. Okay. So, uh, keep grinding. I love it. This has been absolutely fantastic. I think you've you've probably made a lot of new fans tonight. A lot of people watching this. And after this, what I'll do is I'll upload this onto YouTube, Amanda. So you'll have it there. You know, share it with people because I think you have so so much to offer. Like just I understand I understand why Dave threatened me with canceling my subscription now, you know. <laughs> If I didn't have you on here. Who would you like to see on here? Who's someone that that would be good to have on here? People like yourself that I want more people to know of and yeah. pay attention to. Who would be someone yeah. good to have on here? Um, the do, 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 who do I want to see on here? Um, I would love to see. Um. I mean, there's so many good dog breeders. There's so many good dog trainers, right? Like, um, I would love to see, oh gosh, put me on the spot. I told you not to do that. Um, <laughs> uh, give me a second. Um, I don't know. People that are, people that are working hard and putting forth so much effort. Um, I don't know. I would love to see. I can't. I can't. I don't know. You'll think of it when you're when you're off of here, and then you send it to yeah, me. Yeah, and then I'll send it, and I'll be like, okay. Yeah. I think I'm gonna start. I'm in my own little world over here. Like I like, and that's 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 another thing. Like I can't. Um, I I really focus on the people in front of me. I don't really focus on what everybody else is doing, and so sure. Um, you know the the. I guess the main people that I would love to see. Deb Zappia, Mike Deal. I think you've done Wallace Payne, right? So um, Yeah, I did Wallace. Wallace yeah. was great to have on here. Um, yeah, really I'd love it. You know, and and so they, people people interview them all the time. So um But yeah. you know, but you know what, Amanda? I yeah. want people in the pet dog world to see people like that talk. Sure. Yes, and, absolutely. And, and that's why I'm so grateful that you did this because I want people to get off their ass and finally start. Let's get into the working dog <laughs> stuff a little more. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You, um, you know, people are the best pet dog trainers for sure. Absolutely. 100%. Well, listen, I don't want to keep you all night. I can't thank you enough for doing this. This was really fantastic, Amanda. Thank um, you very much. I am very humbled and really appreciative that uh, you asked me. It's super, super cool. No, nah, this is awesome. I'm very, very grateful, and I know you're going to be going very far in this in this whole industry. I, I hope, in I hope so. I'm working hard. We'll see. I think you'll. I think you will. Don't worry about it. Thanks. Have a, a great night. Stay safe up there in the 85 feet of snow you have. I know. Okay? No <laughs> and and please keep in touch if I could ever be of any help because I know I'm going to be hitting you up as soon as I get my puppy. I'll have questions. Love it. Love it. Thanks, Amanda. <laughs> Have a great night. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.